So first of all, welcome to welcome all members, invitees, guests to the 101st uh, BBG meeting. Uh, we broke the century last month, uh, so we are happy to do to carry on with this this month. Uh, we have a full evening. Very interesting speakers coming on. Um, we have a panel discussion on renewable energy. Speak about it a little later. We also have a session on uh, inspirational, motivational talk given by a motivational coach. That's the second half of the segment. In between, uh, we have Paul Dryden from the British Deputy High Commission Chennai who will be giving us a short update about five minutes. Uh, I'm also happy to announce two things. In times of COVID, when there are so many challenges, we have been able to process um, a new membership. It's in progress, membership application from a company called Yani Healthcare, promoters uh, Prahan and Sujata. I think I see Prahan there. Um, they will be inducted shortly as members. Uh, thanks to Kamesh for introducing them to us. Uh, Josh Brooks is also supposed to join the meeting sometime this evening. Um, he and Amberlin, who is our member, have been working on a collaborative project on lake restoration on, on OMR in Siruseri as well as Navalu. They've been doing a, a lot of things. Um, hopefully, they'll be able to give us an update uh, next week. Right. Without further ado, can I now invite uh, Christy? To deliver words from the chairman, Christy. Please. Oh, good evening. Good evening, and welcome to all our good members who could join our meeting today. Uh, very happy to see that we have close to 30 members joining us despite the problems that we had with the link and the connection. Uh, I put up my hands on that one. That was my mistake. I used the old link. Uh, but I would urge people to please read the notices that keep coming because we send out reminders from time to time. And we would like members to note any changes that have taken place. Uh, again, uh, through this period of COVID-19, uh, where travel and all the other limitations, restrictions, and government interference, and lack of decision-making, and wrong decision-making, and all that is going on. Uh, we are lucky that some of us are still able to keep doing our business, and very sad for many who are finding it difficult, not just difficult, but have had to close their activities, close their businesses, and not able to carry on. Uh, I have a feeling that people generally, including politicians and everyone else, should try to understand how real business happens, not just the 5% of us who are doing the business. We want everybody to understand that job creation is not at all an easy thing. And it's a little bit crazy, I would say, from today's news or yesterday's news, that the government is trying to create a body to do recruitment. What are you doing recruitment for? Unless you have the jobs. It's more important to focus on how jobs get created and how we can actually create these jobs. Not the stupid thing of creating, you know, ventures where you're trying to recruit people. Recruitment will not be a problem once you have jobs. So I hope government and others will give more focus to that. Uh, in the UK, they've been going up and down on the COVID front. Things have not been happy at all. Lots of faults are being detected in the way the government has been working. But that's the same all over the world, not just in UK or in America or Brazil or India. Uh, I think in India, we have to be a little happy that uh, despite all the misgivings, 
we've managed the crisis reasonably well and turned around quite a lot of the activities that are needed to connect to the supply of uh, equipment and the ancillaries that go with uh, the medical requirements of COVID. And very happy that somehow India's proved up to this. They've been sort of crisis separately with China trying to divert people's, their own people away from the actual problems within China by going on doing all these other things. Won't, won't speak about it because there's so much of it in the news. Uh, very happy to introduce a new speaker this time, Sanjay Rao, thanks to Hemant. And I hope he'll be giving us an inspirational talk today. Uh, I'd like all of you to listen to what Balaji and Jiva and Sujith have to talk about renewable energy. I usually tell you about some of the things that I read. And today I want to tell you about a book which came out last year. And I'm just putting it up in front. It's Tim Cook of Apple. This book came out last year. When he came on board Apple, people thought he was a very uninspirational, uncharismatic character. But he's completely, completely turned around and taken Apple into a next level. And if you haven't read it, I think this makes a worthwhile read for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy, for your words of inspiration and wisdom. Can I now invite uh, Paul Dryden, who is the Deputy Head of Mission, Chennai, uh, British Deputy High Commission, to say a few words, not more than five minutes, please. Paul? You have to unmute, Paul. Unmute myself. Yes, Hi, I can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes, yes we Excellent. Can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, VJ. Um, and thank you all for joining uh, this evening's uh, meeting. Uh, as ever, I'll just give a brief overview of what's happening um, at our mission and just a few things that are happening in the UK which may or may not be of some interest. Um, just to let you know that the visa section has officially closed now uh, in Chennai, uh, which means that um, all the visas are sent to our office, our High Commission in, in Delhi. Um, it shouldn't change the, um, the time it takes to process the visas. Uh, it, all the most of the staff that uh, uh, all the UK-based staff have been transferred up to Delhi, and uh, um, I'll be honest with you, it hasn't been fully tested yet because the numbers are not up there yet. But uh, I've been informed that they should be taking. Uh, it shouldn't be any more than the uh, the timelines that are published on the website. Uh, the good news in the last month since we have uh, last met, that British Airways have now returned to India. Uh, with flights to Delhi, Mumbai, Hyderabad and Bangalore. And we're very hopeful and fingers crossed, everybody fingers crossed, that BA will be returning to Chennai um, three times a week um, from the 3rd of September. And that's uh, Friday, Monday and Tuesday flights. And we're hoping that that will be inward and outward. For some reason, don't ask me why or how, but some flights um, have only got permissions to fly um, out the way rather than in the way, Bangalore and Hyderabad um, at the moment. Uh, and, but Chennai um, is looking for a inward and outward from the 3rd of September. In fact, flights are actually being sold on the BA website at present. And I can assure you the one on 3rd of September is, uh, if it's not full, uh, by uh, uh, now, it'll be full by the end of the day. It's going like crazy. So it shows that there is demand, which I think is I think is good news. Um, if it's not 3rd of September, we anticipate that it will just be a few days later. It's all about permissions uh, of coming into Tamil Nadu, cargo permissions and all the rest of it. So, but I think that's very, very good news because at the moment, there is no direct flight to any European capitals uh, from Tamil Nadu. And we have to go through Bangalore or a, uh, a other cities in India by domestic flights and all the rest of it. So uh, good news. Uh, Virgin will also be 
returning to uh, India from 1st of September, but from Delhi yeah. and Mumbai. And I understand that will be inward and outward. Um, Oliver is returning on the 8th of September, uh, hopefully on one of those flights. Uh, and I will be going the opposite way. I will be going on leave for about six weeks. Um, uh, I haven't had a day off since the 2nd of January. And uh, uh, as you can imagine, uh, I, I, I'm quite looking forward to, to my leave. And, and I will be going on the, uh, that flight, hopefully, on the 8th of September. If it means that the BA flight is delayed by a few days or in return, then I will change my, my, my flight dates. Mm -hmm. We should know in the next two or three days uh, about confirmation on British Airways. Um, I, I can't remember if we mentioned last time that we had a, a virtual visit from Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon uh, last uh, in August, uh, in early August or early July. I can't remember the, the dates. Um, uh, Lord Ahmed is the Foreign Office uh, Minister uh, for, for India and a, uh, he had a virtual, the first virtual visit from a British minister to, to the UK, uh, to, to India, I should say, and he met a number of a, uh, a stakeholders um, from Delhi, uh, Mumbai, Hyderabad, and, uh, and here in Chennai. Uh, and uh, um, perhaps a, we, we could discuss that later on but it was a, uh, a fruitful visit, and we're already seeing a, uh, um, a, a fruits from that. So that, that is excellent news. Um, and I understand that he will want to continue this um, until it is safe to do so. Um, it has been made very clear to uh, in this government, in Boris Johnson's government, that India is an absolute priority. Um, and unfortunately, with him just coming in December uh, after the election, and then one month later, the COVID virus uh, taking off, uh, then things have not gone quite as planned, but uh, we're hoping to get that back on track. Uh, in the UK itself, um, this week we had a bad news that uh, the, the economy dropped by 20% in the first quarter. Uh, which was the worst on record, and I think the worst in the G7, um, which is obviously not great news. And if anybody who reads BBC a business, um, you will see nearly on a daily basis that retail is just taking a hammering. Uh, Marks and Spencers yesterday announced 7,000 uh, redundancies. Uh, Debenhams have gone into liquidation. Um, House of Fraser is looking to shift some of its uh, estate, ultimately uh, leading to further a, uh, um, a, a, a redundancies. But good news, 75% um, of uh, groceries are now done online in the UK, which has meant a boom um, for in, in tech in that area, as well as uh, a boom in things like uh, drivers, uh, uh, electric cars, uh, um, other vehicles, uh, uh, electric electric um, vans, etc., and that is not just in the uh, uh, one or two uh, uh, groceries. That's throughout the whole of the UK. Um, exams were a fiasco uh, in the last few days. That's been sort of been the big thing. Uh, school exams. Uh, couldn't take place this year, and so there was kind some kind of algorithm that was meant to be predicting who what who got what. Uh, it was a uh, it seems to be uh, not successful in Scotland and England, uh, where there are of course separate uh, uh, educational establishments uh, and the way they do education. For example, I did hires in in Scotland, while in England you do A levels, uh, and so there are, there has been a big big issue with that, with people not getting the grades that they were expecting. Um, there has been a U-turn, and that is sort of been, but, but the government has taken a hit on that, especially the education system, uh, Secretary Gavin Williamson. On COVID itself, uh, it's quite an interesting setup at the moment. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in mainland Europe, 
the numbers have been rising um, alarmingly. Uh, Spain, I, I saw the other day, I think 12,000 new cases per day now. Uh, France catching up, Germany, Cyprus, Malta, and etc. cetera. Um, in the UK, um, although they have risen, there are plateauing around about 1,000 a day uh, for the whole of the UK. And it seems to be in, in, in certain pockets in parts of uh, the country, uh, very randomly. Uh, Aberdeen, uh, the north of England, uh, it, it seems to be, and I, I, I hear from you about your uh, alcohol issue, um, it seems to be that since they opened the pubs up, uh, that is where the, the issues have arisen. Um, in Aberdeen alone, uh, I think there were something like uh, 100 to 200 new cases all linked uh, with the uh, uh, pubs in Aberdeen, including eight Aberdeen football club players uh, who went in where they weren't meant to. They were quarantined, uh, and, and, but they went in for a drink after a game and uh, eight of them caught uh, the, uh, the, the, the COVID, uh, which has caused, caused chaos in the Scottish Football League, if you are interested. Um, deaths are very low at the moment, thankfully. We seem to have got the, uh, well, I don't want to be too complacent on this, but um, in the, I've just gone on to the, the National Health of England cases, and in the last three days, uh, there have been uh, uh, 21 deaths in, in England. So 777 seems to be fairly uh, um, consistent, and thankfully consistently low, but I, I would like to pass on my condolences to those who have been affected by this. Um, on quarantine, it is still 14 days. Anybody from India traveling, including myself, going back to the UK, you have to quarantine yourself uh, in your uh, house or your hotel, etc., before you can go out. So clearly it, things are not normal, but things are moving that way. And uh, we're hoping for good news on the, on the um, on, on the, uh, the vaccine, uh, which seems to be uh, neck and neck with the Germans. Where have we heard that before? Um, let's, uh, let's hope that uh, whoever wins this race, it's not a race between countries, it's a race for humanity. So let's get this uh, fixed so that we can fix the world. And that's it for me, unless anybody has any questions. Thank you, Thank you Paul. We'll, we'll come back to questions later. Thanks so much. Uh, if not the least, at least for the glimmer of hope that Chennaiites can claim the airport to be the hub for the south, you know, good to see BA landing here again after a long gap, um, moving forward. Thank you so much. No problem. Now, now we come to the uh, first uh, large segment of this session, uh, the panel discussion on renewable energy. If some of you are asking why renewable energy, well, I think it's going to affect all of us. You will hear it from the panel. Uh, Government of India has announced a, a, a very ambitious target of 500 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy power generation by the year 2030, which means it will have to replace a lot of aging, obsolete, thermal-fired, coal-fired, conventionally-fired plants uh, all over the country. So without much ado, let me just introduce very quickly the panel. We have, first of all, uh, lawyer Jiva. Jiva is the Chennai head, head of practice, um, Chennai office for Fox Mandel. Jiva is a industry veteran in the area of renewable energy, particularly in M&A mergers and acquisitions work, uh, legal due diligence, etc. A huge amount of experience, cross-border. Uh, Jiva, incidentally, is also a Fulbright fellow. Uh, next on the list is uh, Balaji. Balaji, as most of us know him, uh, eats, breathes, lives, sleeps uh, renewable energy. I think if you suddenly woke him up from his sleep, he'll probably jabber something about RE, you know, and numbers. Uh, he's known to be a numbers man. Uh, he's currently the project coordinator and principal consultant for Solon in India, which I understand is one of the largest EPCs in the world in the area of solar energy. Uh, last but certainly not the least is young Srijit Menon. Srijit is uh, the BDHC and DIT lead for renewable energy in India. He's stationed here in Chennai. 
Uh, he will be representing uh, UK's interests in promoting, especially, I think, their expertise in wind energy. So uh, it's all to the panel now. Jiva, it's all yours. I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Um, thank you for the quick introductions. Um, so, gentlemen, ladies um, uh, in attendance today, I'm happy to be leading a panel of two um, subject matter experts, I must say, uh, Srijit and uh, Balaji. As uh, Vijay rightly said, Balaji lives, breathes uh, renewable energy. Uh, in addition to Balaji, we have Srijit, who holds sport from the uh, UK side of things, trying to uh, strengthen and bolster uh, ties between India and the UK, and also to focus um, substantially on renewable energy, which is part of his portfolio. So I'm happy to be uh, a part of this panel. I'll try and um, uh, keep the panel uh, questions uh, and answers short uh, to ensure that uh, you're able to fully comprehend. Uh, just a couple of quick instructions before I start uh, with the panelists is um, if you'd be so kind as to send all uh, questions only to the moderator by choosing the chat box and addressing any questions only to the moderator or to Vijay Krishna. We are both happy to moderate uh, questions eventually. Uh, we would like for the panelists to answer uh, the questions first that are posed to them. And uh, we will certainly take audience questions at the end of the uh, session. Um, so with Vijay's permission, we will start. Uh, we obviously, renewable energy is, uh, has been largely talked about for the last uh, you know, 20 or so years. And uh, I can remember uh, from not very long ago that, uh, you know, 2020 was one of those critical uh, milestones for the UK as well. If my, understand, my, if my recollection is correct, there was going to be 20% uh, of the UK to be powered by renewables by 2020. Um, obviously, there have been challenges getting there. India had a very large renewable energy push for 2020. Uh, and, and of course, we've been off track a little bit. Uh, we've had a massive amount of uh, wind installations uh, and, and solar used to be uh, the, the, the stepchild which the government was trying to promote. And we've kind of run the full circle between wind and solar because uh, not very long ago, about eight years ago, we saw that um, you know, there were supposed to be hybrid projects of wind and solar only to ensure that uh, you know uh, solar could also find place. Now we are in a position where um, you know uh, we are again uh, you know getting uh, to promote hybrid projects. This time to get more wind, uh, more attention to wind because solar is hogging all the attention of late. So uh, obviously we've seen a lot of changes with uh, you know going from feed-in tariffs in India to. Uh, reverse bidding system, uh, the Solar Energy Corporation of India taking a lot of uh, ground currently in, uh, you know, in projects. So the largest buyers now being based on Solar uh, Energy Corporation of India, SECI in short, and, and also NTPC. So um, with, with that background and, and given that I've worked personally on uh, solar projects for the last, uh, sorry, wind and solar projects for the last 16 years, and uh, my team has actually seen about close to five gigawatt of installation in India in wind uh, and, and solar. Uh, I'm fairly uh, interested to understand from our experts today uh, where we are going, where are we with renewable energy in India and around the world, and, and also to understand uh, what the future looks like for renewables. So um, I'll cut this monologue, get your questions down. Uh, so uh, Srijit Balaji, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I, my first question is actually to Balaji. Uh, Balaji, what do you think is the origin of renewable energy, um, and what is the current scenario? Both in uh, you know both across the world and specifically to our dear India. Balaji, you're not audible. I must uh, stop you. You're not audible. Just check if you're. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Good evening. Um, it's always nice to bat after scoring hundred. So we had hundred first meeting. So the pressure is off in terms of deliverance. 
the origin of renewable energy uh, actually uh, once again aircraft is going i hope it's not a british airways uh yeah we, we hope it's british airways and i'm actually not uh, unhappy this time uh, to hear the sound of an aircraft we've all become accustomed to very clear and uh, you know uninterrupted skies so balaji back to you yeah okay so um, the concept of renewable energy actually starts with solar as early as 7th century bc where the, the human started uh, uh, discovering how to make fire and that actually uh, uh, transformed the world uh, uh, humans started uh, discovered fire and then they started burning the earth then they found out the wheel and the wheel discovered the industrialization today whatever we are that's actually the origin of uh, so solar energy to start with in renewable energy later on the inventions took uh, a very major step slowly uh, and then it went on to uh, hydro by and large that's one of the reason we talk about uh, the across the world we talk uh, the measurement of hydro generation is called in water years not in uh, uh, any specific calendar year or fiscal year and then of course the wind came into picture these are all about more than 3000 years old uh but, but uh, renewable energy uh, started uh, getting primary importance across the world when people have understood that we are spoiling the environment by and large by using fossil fuels and the conventional energy by and large using coal was actually very disturbing apart from the carbon emissions we have so uh, that actually uh, set a path in terms of how do we protect the environment in the last 50 years they've been very conscious decision especially uh, during the late 80s uh, when we had uh, the kyoto protocol being signed by all the countries in the world 182 countries were signatories of kyoto protocol and then uh, we had uh, us and china not signing the agreement so that that actually a biggest back, uh, setback but uh, the world started realizing the fact that uh, unless they start looking at renewable energy in a big way progressively at least uh, the environment is going to get very very bad and there is nothing we could leave for the next couple of generations later so that is the, the backdrop on which rea started but currently uh, uh, let me talk about two aspects one is the india and one is the world where are we actually uh, in india we have uh, closely about um, 30 um, about 11 percent of the total installed capacity of the power in india is uh, comes out renewables it is about roughly about uh, uh, 84 gigawatt that's about 8400 gigawatts gigawatts that constitutes of wind solar uh, hydro hydro means uh, anything less than 25 megawatt in hydro is comes in renewable energy and then we have the cogen uh, cogeneration as well among these things the the wind was the most prominent till four years back but solar took a very strong leap uh, to some extent thanks to at that point of time the government encouragement uh, so it is almost uh, trailing along with uh, the along with uh, the wind itself so currently we have about uh, uh, 37 um, 30, 3700 37.69 gigawatt of uh, solar 34.62 megawatt gigawatt of wind and we also have a, a, a hydro to about 4.6 gigawatt this uh, considerably places total around 371 gigawatt of uh, power generation we have so far but going forward the government has already given a strong uh, target of installing about 175 gigawatt of renewable energy primarily constituting of 60 uh, gigawatt of uh, wind and about one 110 gigawatt of solar and the balance comes out of cogen and hydro as such uh, what is uh, 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 stopping the growth i think uh, or what is putting us back in the process i will come back to it later as we go by thanks balaji um, appreciate uh, the the uh, overall picture of how renewable energy started uh, and and where we are now uh, I'd, I'd like to move on to srijit srijit is uh, an expert on, on on green recovery in addition to his uh, bilateral uh, relationship aspects um, now srijit question for you is you know when we look at green recovery as a concept i would like for you to explain what is green recovery to our audience and also kind of take us through 
to you know renewable energies part within green recovery sure um thanks so much um given once again thanks so much bbg uh, for inviting me and i kind of feel really um, um uplifted given the fact that i'm sharing a panel along with balaji who's, who's who's an expert as well as you jeeva uh, and just answering the question really quickly on green recovery um it's a it's a concept or a topic that actually gained a lot of prominence of late um selfishly thanks to covid but it is a topic that has existed for quite a while uh, green recovery is a very simple concept it's something that um uh, it's it, it's talking about using uh, regulatory from framework policies uh, regulations from from various government entities uh countries basically moving towards a greener cleaner safer um uh, uh, business environment uh, and basically not going back to a situation where a uh, sustainable development did not exist so that's basically what uh, you know if, if i could put it, put it in the most simpler uh, simple form uh, form of words green recovery is um and over the next 6 to 18 months um uh it's it's estimated that over you know countries will invest nearly 20 trillion dollars worth of um, uh of of money uh, into green recovery due to the follow fallout of covid-19 um and uh, you know the the makeup of the financial decisions uh will definitely define the shape of how uh our societies and how our businesses are basically or economies for that matter is is going to be shaping up for for decades to come um including our uh, including our ability to spend um uh and respond to greater environmental crises uh, and environmental challenges so that's basically in terms of uh, uh you know what uh, if, if i can set the scene or basically lay the context of green recovery um and tackling climate change you know like the, uh, tackling the cl- uh, climate crisis um and social economic issues that we're facing right now because uh, as an impact of covid-19 um we 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 really require a, a, a holistic approach uh, to to recovery planning you know we we really don't want to be going back to how things were in the past um and that's where the concept of green recovery will really kick in you know it's about uh, adopting innovative um uh, green solutions green technology um green economy policies um uh, anything to do with uh, a country paving way towards developing its economy but in a m- much more um a green a uh, sustainable uh, way of development and this is where um, you know it, it is key for india because it goes back to the point that christy mentioned uh, quite early in his introduction about jobs and you know um, employment green recovery also has a factor within the concept about uh, creating jobs and creating new uh, employment opportunities within a much more sustainable uh, and a much more cleaner greener safer environment and that basically forms a part of how uh, uh uh you know how how green uh, recovery policies are being shaped if again just quickly give you an example of um, of basically what i've been blabbering about is um if 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 you just go back to what have uh, you know to towards the nationwide lockdown that india imposed uh, and you you know you we've all seen multiple news and uh, articles and um uh social media posts about people being able to see you know uh, clear blue skies in delhi uh clear blue skies in punjab where they can see uh you know uh, mountain ranges mountain ranges after after a really long time that is clear evidence in terms of how much we have actually polluted the environment through our various um, development projects and that example or or like i said you know very selfishly thanks to covid is actually given an understanding among society among your general population as well as businesses that there is a real problem that um uh, you know that that been going on for a while and that's definitely affecting not just uh, our environment but also myself or you know a, a, a person's individual health and that has helped in a way for governments and entities and businesses to kind of start adopting these sustainable practices and green uh, practices and that's why green recovery is now part of of our cop26 agenda which will uh, which the uk is hosting next year in november in glasgow so the cop26 is basically the conference of the parties where we invite uh, where countries are invited from across the globe to speak on climate change uh, get a climate change based action to be promised and to take that forward uh, and 
and over the last couple of months, ever since the lockdown uh, was was uh, was announced in India, there's been a couple of measures that were announced by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy in India, which uh, which, which shows a positive sign that the government is thinking and looking at green recovery. Uh, and uh, from the UK's perspective, we hope to support and take that uh, decision as well as that thinking forward. Uh, Ziva, I'm going to stop there. I know I'm... I'm Thanks, Srijit. That's, that's, no, that's very useful. See, uh, you know, the, the change, as I can see it, actually is uh, one where 10 years ago, it was the other parts of the economy trying to give renewable energy a hand in subsidizing various things. Today, you know, renewable energy is causing a number of jobs to be created and, and you know, it's putting so much more money into the economy, inviting, uh, you know, billions of dollars in, uh, uh, in investments into India, both equity and uh, debt funding into green businesses. And also, uh, you know, even uh, locally generating jobs and businesses in, in we've seen small and medium-sized businesses thrive because of renewable energy so uh, the emphasis and importance of renewable energy as an industry today is not where you do something for fancy and say i'm getting my um, electricity from wind even if i pay twice the cost to saying here is a sustainable source where I can actually look at this as a business model, look at this as a sustainable manner of not just um, uh, not just stop environmental or sl slow down environmental degradation, but to uh, put this down as a business that is self-sustainable, stands on its own feet, and does not depend on subsidies. So uh, that's that's how uh, you know I look at renewable energy uh, projects today. So I'm I'm back to Balaji, who's the uh, financial wiz on rene renewable energy projects, to ask him, you know, what does he, what do you think, Balaji, of the financial parameters that are critical for renewable energy projects as against uh, conventional energy projects, and is it that renewable energy projects are actually viable today? What are your views? Just to, uh, before I answer a question, uh, I missed the one point last question was, what is the total installed capacity of renewable energy in India? In the world, I'm sorry, it's about 2.35 million. Why we, why we sorry to interject. No, we'll come back to that. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to that. I have a further question because I know that you like your statistics. I'm actually going to come back to that. Okay. All right. Yeah, so, that uh, coming back to uh, the renewable energy projects is by and large is highly capital intensive. One should note that very clearly. And uh, uh, and this, uh, there's a comparative financial structure is made available. Uh, it will be difficult for one to uh, have a very profitable numbers. Uh, but what, what determines here is the cost of capital at which you're trying to borrow uh, on the commercial side and what kind of uh, technical upgradation you have in terms of making the capacity utilization factor uh, maintained for a certain level is very important. In today's uh, situation, I would say today means the last one decade, the, 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 finance, the availability of finance has made a, a big game changer to such an extent to where you have a, a large size renewable energy projects, almost close to each of the projects coming close to about 500 megawatts as such has been uh, installed in India by and large. And these, are, these came about basically because the low cost of finance are available uh, outside India. So, uh, and most of the large corporates in India has been able to borrow, access that kind of money and, uh, and invest in India as such. But uh, that was not uh, uh, the story with uh, other kind of players, small or medium kind of players who uh, to access that kind of stuff. So all these big players, when they went into the market to borrow large capital outside, they on the one side they they discounted that uh, India is going to be a very large uh, economy in terms of growth rate being about uh, nine plus percent of GDP as a, as a result of which they don't have to hitch and uh, they bo started borrowing money in about uh, LIBOR plus two percent about landed cost about three three and a half percent and they gave an equity uh, the internal rate of, rate of returns on the equity guys almost close to north of 23 24 percent. But that took a very major spin because in India, as Jiva said in, in Jiva said in his introduction remarks, that we branched out from the feed-in tariff of a river, this read, uh, 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 bidding of tariff on a reverse model, where people started bidding at a very very low tariff to be competitive, and sadly enough, that lower tariff resulted in a very very tight spot. 
so and so that on the one side they have to deliver about 15 to 16 percent equity IRR as against 24 20 24%. And the tariff has fallen so low, people started not hedging the, the overseas loan and started building the project. But the read the discovery of tariff has become so low beyond a point, it has come to close to about uh, in Indian rupees, about as close about two rupees 30 paise per unit which was actually against the feed-in tariff support of our cost about four rupees that made the project unviable. So now the read is the discovery of tariff on the one side, government promoted to be in a big way as, in, as way back in 2015, which started about five rupees 40 paise. It has come down by three rupees to two rupees 40, two rupees 30 paise today. Now to make this viable, uh, the, 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 the reverse bidding has to have a uh, defined floor price and of course, they can have the forbearance and upsides without which uh, the things are not going to work out. Unless you, uh, the investor gets about 15 to 16% post-tax return in India, particularly, it is not, it's going to be very challenging. That's one, uh, one take. Secondly, in India, the debt availability is also highly streamlined because not many banks are comfortable in funding the government promoted projects such as the Saki projects because uh, the quality of the project has suffered so much. Uh, the imports have from our... The, so-called neighbor has been virtually going to get stopped now and that is going to uh, make the run uh, in terms of uh, the project being viable uh, uh, to the required extent of the rate of return of 15-16% uh, post-tax. Now what is uh, what needs to be done is the government should come forward and allow a special kind of financing possibility to solar and renewable energy projects, more particularly about solar because the, 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 the plant load factor of solar is just about, levelized about 18% plus or minus, whereas the wind is about almost 27, 28%. Unless they extend a highly competitive funding uh, in India for at least for the debt, and the leveraging about 70, 30 normative debt equity, it's going to be a tough challenge. Thanks for that, Balaji. Uh, well, while we here, I mean, as um, to we are, you know, in, at times, professionals, we have we, had, we wear different hats. We are um, industry body members. We are businessmen, but we are also people who run our own homes. And I've not seen, at least for myself, the um, change uh, from uh, from from you know, let's say the six rupees per uh, unit that we were paying to anything less, uh, despite the you know. Um, uh, rate of procurement of energy going down substantially and uh, we continuously hear about uh, you know more efficient transmission systems that are in place therefore transmission losses have been cut down substantially now it's it's intriguing uh, for a common person to see that you know rates have gone from five rupees of procurement price to two and a half rupees rates have been cut by half technology has improved allegedly but if we really see the common man actually has not gotten the benefit of uh, the rate reduction. What do you think about that? Yeah. See, um, uh, in this famous saying in English, the, the proof of pudding lies in eating, not in making. While we, uh, we thump on the desk saying that we installed so many capacity of renewable energy from all sources, but the, efficient, the, the plant load factor is as close as 18% in solar and 27-28% weighted average plant load factor in wind. And these are a very small contributed to the total generation capacity of the power in India as such. Unless we, inc we increase the installed capacity to a larger extent, uh, it is not going to come down. Secondly, in India particularly, most of the distribution companies or state utilities are really at a tremendous amount of losses, you should know very well. And uh, to curtail that, unless we have an extraordinary fiscal measure coming up, these, we, I don't think we'll ever see the reduction of tariff from the, from the domestic consumption, what you're going to have. Having said that, uh, we, I, I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, very pessimistic, but one is very certain that the tariff, uh, uh, say in a state like Tamil Nadu, is really going to see a very high tariff coming up in the next one year after the, after the elections are over next year, because we are already reeling close to about uh, 135,000 1, crores of rupees we have a deficit, we already have. I don't think in our lifetime we could uh, see a reduction in tariff. At the most, what can happen is we can only sustain this tariff, perhaps it's on a very aggressive basis. Reduction in tariff is not going to be possible at all. I see, Balaji. Thank you. But I don't know, Balaji, about you, but I'm planning to live another 60 years. So I'm hoping that uh, you know, in my lifetime, things should change. 
Uh, now over to Srijit, uh, we hear about, uh, you know, the progress that we've made in energy evolution. Um, what is it that you think, uh, Srijit, what is our position in terms of energy evolution? Where do you think we're going from here on? Thanks, Deva. Um, so in terms of energy evolution, and if I can take, if I can speak about um, India in particular, um, See, we, you know, as Balaji mentioned and Diva, as you mentioned, see, India has become one of the world's largest solar markets in, in the span of uh, 10 or a little bit over 10 years. Um, and that that itself, you know, is, is a market that's been mature already. You have um, onshore wind as well, which is, which is quite developed in India. And no one really expected onshore wind to develop as much as it has when it was first introduced in the country. Um, in terms of evolution, when it comes to renewable energy in India, it's quite profound. It depends on uh, how things uh, go from now. And the, the pandemic has definitely put a small dent in, in a couple of projects and a couple of plans. But at least in terms of our discussions and in terms of um, understanding from a government of India's perspective, speaking to the MNRE, we believe and we are seeing for a fact that uh, the next evolution or the next big thing that will happen in India on renewables is offshore wind. Um, and you can see a lot of work that's being put into, um, into offshore wind by, by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, by the National Institute of Wind Energy in Chennai. Um, and, and one important thing that I think at least makes us, me and, uh, and the post crowd here is uh, Tamil Nadu and Chennai as a, as, as a city plays a major role for offshore wind. Um, Tamil Nadu has the uh, largest or more than half of India's offshore wind capacity, uh, potential capacity in the country, after which is Gujarat. Uh, Tamil Nadu also uh, has the best wind resource in comparison to, to Gujarat. So in terms of evolution that we're seeing, um, we, we, we expect offshore wind to be the next big wave in terms of hitting uh, the renewable energy market. Obviously, that's, that, that's something that involves uh, uh, a, a, a major capital intensive uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, work to be done on, on offshore wind. And there's multiple stakeholders who are already um, working on, on offshore wind. You know? So, for example, the High Commission uh, uh, in Chennai, we, we work extremely closely with uh, the government of India on how we can help develop the offshore wind uh, uh, in, in the future. And as Paul mentioned in his in his uh, inaugural address, uh, we've made cons um, you know quite a lot of progress on on these discussions with India, and we're looking at a major announcement happening in the next couple of months. Uh, so, what happens after offshore wind? Um, and I mean, offshore wind. If if you look at the numbers, India expects to have around five gigawatts uh, of offshore wind to be installed by 2022, um, and that. Um, you know, that itself shows the amount of uh, ambition that lies over there. I mean, that is still, those numbers still need to be uh, re-verified because of the COVID um, situation. But five gigawatts of uh, offshore wind uh, ambition is massive. And I say that because if you look at the UK, uh, UK has the world's largest installed offshore wind capacity in comparison to any other country in the world. Um, the UK has an installed capacity as of August 2020, uh, 10 gigawatts. So if, you're, if, if you have a scenario where India has an ambition of 5 gigawatts by 2022, I mean, that itself proves what, you know, the, the next big thing that's going to hit the market. Now, what happens once the offshore wind sector uh, matures, which obviously is going to uh, happen eventually in the next 10, 15 years? We're talking about, we're already talking about floating offshore wind, um, which, um, which there's already discussions going on between uh, research experts from India as well as other countries. Floating offshore wind will be uh, will be the natural cycle for India to follow after the evolution into offshore wind. And we will also be, see a major uh, advancement in storage technology while the development of offshore wind and other wind uh, technology in the country. Um, and one last point, which I should have mentioned quite early was uh, the the evolution into hybrid technology, which is solar and wind combined, onshore wind combined, you will see quite a lot of those kind of projects as well taking off uh, in the new, near future. So that's where, in terms of um, the evolution of renewable energy in India, or what that's basically what it looks like in the near future. Give us. Thanks, Rijit. So, um, you know, we've talked a fair amount uh, about solar and wind, 
But renewables is not just solar and wind. Uh, you know, uh, in a country like India, where we throw out so much waste, municipal solid waste to energy is, uh, is considered renewable energy. There's supposed to be hydroelectric. Of course, we spoke and touched upon hydroelectric um, uh, to a limited extent. Uh, we have uh, very few perennial rivers in India, so I can understand that uh, hydroelectric projects, at least that are river originated and, and you know, uh, are, are, are few and far between. But why are we not, uh, you know, touching upon uh, more of municipal solid waste to energy or, uh, you know, biomass um, or even geothermal? Uh, is it something that, uh, you know, uh, Balaji, do you think uh, you have some views about these other forms of renewable energy? Balaji, you are on mute. Uh, there are three, four, three other forms of energy which is on, the, on the mainstream. One is the hydro, which is less than 25 megawatt. Uh, comes under renewable energy. One is, of course, the biomass. One is the, the, the waste to energy. Let me pick up from waste to energy. The total installed capacity of waste to energy in India till last December last year was about 147 megawatts only. It's high, extremely distributed in all the 29 states in India and the unit territories. One of the major reasons why it is not growing faster because the collection mechanism of the municipal waste has been very dismal. That's very important. That's very important point to note. Uh, not many corporations of the city or the states in India are fully geared up in terms of uh, um, collection of the municipal waste and the um, and the, the domestic waste as such. So unless that is streamlined, uh, unless we have the the feed in stock to generate power, it is no, it's going to be very difficult. I've seen. Uh, uh, in fact, my exposure to collection of waste was as early as 2004 in, in Belgium, where I we found we are trying to put a uh, test project in a city called Nagpur, India, on the on, the, on in Maharashtra, where uh, the technology was good, everything was good, but the collection mechanism once it started, it's a very about it's hardly about a 500 kilowatts project, which couldn't drive because the we found that after one month after the project was started, the collection became so bad that even the iron scrap started coming into the collection mechanism. So that has really put forth the, 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 big, the biggest tumbling block. But the government is actually trying to do a lot of things on a waste on energy because they're trying to promote this in extremely uh, in in far uh, remote areas, uh, uh, villages in India. So that will take some time uh, for to come in the mainstream. Uh, second is the biomass. Biomass like, uh, has got a very high uh, regulated mechanism in India. Uh, and to some extent it was successful. And to a larger extent it was a failure because uh, uh, that uh, we had a technology that uh, that was uh, not driving to take multiple fuels in burning the um, uh, in burning the fuel because to have a to uh, to have a uh, uh, the thumb rule is you need about 4500 kcal of uh, heat to generate biomass and by that can give one can be given only by wood but uh, we have a mixed kind of fuels uh, which can really promote but uh, in most of the places in india where they restrict the licenses to about two projects in a district and those districts does not have a multiple uh, large amount of uh, fuels available this is one of the reasons that the, the things have failed by and large. But there are successful projects in biomass in the western part of India, in Punjab and all. Although they are driven by three or four uh, kind of uh, fuel, but they are available in plenty. For example, the rice husks, uh, the wood waste, those kind of stuff, so they are doing very well. But one of the successful projects of biomass in the world is actually based in the in Austrian Swiss, Swiss border. It's promoted by a company called Ackermann Van Haren in Belgium. They have a 120 megawatt single largest biomass project in the world, which predominantly uh, fed by wood to close about 90% of the waste. That's on the biomass side. Uh, and as far as the hydro is concerned, very interesting because uh, most of the uh, hydro project less than 25 comes in renewable energy. And these are mostly by around the river projects. Uh, you, you find all these kind of smaller projects of half a, meg half a megawatt or a two megawatt projects in Northeast is part of India. But on the mainstream, like the states like Karnataka, they're all of the run of the river project, but uh, they're not, all of them was not doing so well because the design which has actually uh, shaped up very nicely today was not so good. When you, when you, you need about close to about uh, uh, 6,000 cusecs of water 
to run a, a single turbine. But uh, what the problem is, most of the guys in technology, what they had, they used to have a three or four turbines in a single lot where that kind of uh, water availability is not there. So that also one of the reasons that uh, outside Northeast, not many successful renewable energy projects uh, of hydro has been, has been there. But the government is doing a lot of work now. The, the, today we have a, a turbine, um, uh, the, the gas turbine, the, the, the hydro turbine to run even close to about uh, 200 kilowatt or 300 kilowatt. That's really going to take off in a big way, which is going to be a part of the highly distributed uh, power generation mechanism in India. Thanks, Balaji. Um, so, uh, but in the UK India perspective, uh, Srijit, do you think there is going to be focus on these other forms of renewable energy? Um, definitely, Jeeva. We we are seeing quite a lot of um, we are seeing quite a lot of companies in the UK showing interest. Um, in the Indian market, on on other areas of renewables, just not on a uh, wind, on on onshore wind or offshore wind or even solar for that matter. Uh, if I, if I can give you an example, we have a, a soon to be announced uh, uh, MOU signing between uh, a UK company who's expert when it comes to biofuel manufacturing. This is using or basically basically collecting waste from your food and beverages industry and converting that into biofuels. Uh, they plan on setting up 25 manufacturing plants across the country in the next five years. Um, that's just one example of many things that we're looking at. We have um, uh, we have companies who are looking to um, increase the existing uh, efficiency of products or of uh, uh, energy uh, producing uh, 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 components in India or machines in India. Those that technology uh, is is, look, is is looking for a partner in India, basically. We have multiple research organizations in the UK who are looking uh, at India as a test bed, not just in the area of uh, waste to energy, but also looking at areas for uh, uh, hybrid technology, uh, uh, wind, solar, as I mentioned earlier. We're looking at uh, uh, waste incineration based technology, which reduces carbon emissions at the same time, increases the efficiency, and you can use that to, um, uh, uh, to generate electricity as well. So we have those kind of technologies that's being that's being looked at in India. Um, so there's multiple companies as well as research organizations in the UK who are keenly looking at uh, the at the Indian market to enter. Um, and we, you know, we, we're looking for the right partners for them. We're looking for potential um, uh, research organizations that can partner. Uh, and one thing we strongly believe is if if you really need to start or if you really need to kick off something in India. Throw a pilot project into the picture. Do a pilot project. Showcase how the technology really works, uh, how it really uh, brings about a change. And that's what we're trying to do. You know, so, we get that, uh, you know, so sorry to cut you off, but I am actually, uh, you know, that segues well into my next question, which is, you know, given that, uh, you know, UK and India have always had, you know, strong bilateral ties in terms of business, what is being done on the renewables front? And can you also give some ideas as to what type of funding is available? for Indian companies to explore renewables because that's going to be directly useful for the audience. Sure, um, good question. So um, let, let me take let me take this in, in two folds in terms of what we've done in the past, what we're doing right now. Um, so in the past, we, um, we have worked actively in India on renewables, but the focus hasn't been much towards renewables, if I can say it's been more towards the oil and gas industry and how to reduce carbon emissions over there. So we had a dedicated team that looked after that in India. Uh, but post-2018, we signed an MOU uh, with the government of India to support India towards uh, reducing and achieving its carbon emission uh, 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 target. And part of that MOU, uh, uh, we, we promised a set certain amount of money that would be given from the UK in the form of a technical assistance program. And that this technical assistance program basically um, would support India in its quest towards certain forms of renewables. So there was 14 million pounds that was uh, pumped into a project called the PSR program, which is the Power Sector Reforms Program back in 2018. Um, uh, and discussions for that program started in 2016, but the funding was made available in 2018. Uh, it's a program undertaken by the Department for International Development, uh, DFID as we call it, and the PSR program basically uh, works on, uh, along with the Ministry of Power and the Ministry of New Renewable Energy to help develop a brand new policy framework to make sure that India's 
India's regulatory framework is up and ready and running to go once we've got all the different renewable energy clusters coming together. So that program is something that's ongoing. It's a 14 million pound uh, program spread over a span of six to seven years. Uh, the other important thing is the setting up of a joint equity fund, uh, investment equity fund, called the Green Growth Equity Fund, uh, 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 that, that is a partnership between the UK government and the Indian government. Uh, the investors into the Green Growth Equity Fund is DFID and the Indian government department called NIF, which is the National Infrastructure Investment Fund. Um, we have recently seen a major investment from BP as well, who's made uh, if I'm correct, nearly 70 million pounds worth of investment into the Green Growth Equity Fund. And the main idea of this fund is to, is to basically be give equity-based investments into any green uh, infrastructure projects in India. Um, and these projects will be supported by the UK government in partnership with the Indian government to help develop uh, uh, infrastructure on renewables. The other thing what we've been working on very closely in India is through the CDC, which is basically our funding arm for the DFID. Um, so DFID basically is, uh, sorry, CDC is basically a funding arm of DFID that uh, manages uh, uh, HMG, which is Her Majesty's Government, uh, uh, Her Majesty's Government uh, direct funding that comes from this. And we target specific sustainable development projects in India we target uh, certain green projects, green field projects, IPP projects across the country, and we provide pro project-based funding for these. Um, so it's it's a multitude of things that we're working on. It's it's um, and there's a lot of commercial sensitive things as well, which I'm not allowed to disclose. Uh, but we've been doing quite a lot of active work right from the center with the Ministry of, um, of New and Renewable Energy, uh, and we also had Prime Minister Theresa May have a conversation with Prime Minister Modi during her visit last time and uh, uh, offering to help develop in their offshore wind. So there will be an announcement soon on that as well towards the end of this year. Either. Thanks, Rijit. Looks like, you know, there's a couple of uh, important announcements on the anvil, so we should look forward to that. Uh, now, Balaji uh, and Srijit, we have a uh, little time left on this panel. Um, you know, this is obviously a large uh, in-depth content that we are handling on this panel. So let's uh, try and attack the next couple of questions, which will be uh, before we go into Q&A, which uh, Vijay will moderate. Uh, now, in terms of um, the India's current position, uh, on, on total power and specifically from renewable energy sources. Balaji, could you tell us the stats on that uh, in, in India? And, and potentially you can also tell us stats of where India stands uh, in, in terms of uh, global capacity as well. Balaji, again, you're on mute. Uh, currently, the total installed capacity of renewable energy is about 22, 22 and a half percent as against uh, uh, the total installed capacity of 378 gigawatts. So that clearly sets in the target of the government requirement of uh, making 20 percent of the uh, generation has to come from uh, renewables. But sadly enough, that policy is so uh, uh, ambiguous that they said the installed capacity has to be 20 percent, not the power alone. So uh, uh, that's one thing. Globally, of course, uh, the, the total uh, renewable energy installed across the world uh, is about uh, 2.35 million gigawatt. Uh, in, in terms of Indian figures, it's going to be about 23 lakhs 51,000 uh, megawatt as such globally. But uh, the, the, the focus uh, outside India has been very big outside solar and uh, we should see uh, how it's going to work. But uh, ironically, uh, among the five large projects in the world in solar, India has almost uh, uh, two projects out of that uh, because one, we have a uh, I just got the, my old uh, archives removed. We have the, uh, the, the about 500, uh, 600 megawatt project in Morocco first, and then it was followed by in India by Adani Group, uh, which is commissioned in, in Tamil Nadu. It's about 648 megawatt. But the good thing was the tariff was almost 120% higher than the current tariff on the reverse buildings available today. Which we, they are they very lucky to have it. Then we have the, the, the Chinese guys having close to about 800 megawatt. But I was told that there's a 3,000 megawatt of solar project in China, which is not officially announced as such, but that seems to be the largest in, in the world. 
and we also have a 2000 megawatt uh, solar park in india in karnataka actually that's a very big thing uh, but the one which has got commissioned in india about last month in madhya pradesh is about 800 megawatt it was told to be the largest in india but actually that's not the largest the largest we have in karnataka is about 2000 megawatt as such uh, maybe on a singular uh, basis that could have been the largest but the largest in concentration we have is only 2000 megawatt in, in karnataka. karnataka in a place called tumkuru oh. district of karnataka Thanks, Balaji. Uh, the very final question, uh, Srijit, to you is: um, What is the uh, you know policy that you think will help uh, enlarge ties between India and the UK in um, renewable energy? Uh, we obviously hear uh, much about uh, the offshore wind policy. Is there anything that you think that can be done in addition to the policy on offshore wind and the discussions between the governments? No, absolutely. In terms of, um, if I can specifically talk about policy, this is something that we recently had a conversation on um, uh, with the government of India. It's see, no country in the world has managed to develop offshore wind without having a regulatory, a proper regulatory framework in place. There's not, there's not been a history, and, I, and it's really hard for us to, to, to even implement something on those lines. So where the conversation and discussion is happening at the moment is in terms of making sure. Uh, you have a regulatory framework in place that not only caters to your future offshore wind projects, but also caters to the existing installed renewable energy capacity of the country. And how you would integrate your, uh, you would integrate into the grid the offshore wind or the electricity being generated from uh, offshore wind. So there needs to be a clear cut policy in place right up at the center and a devolution of that through uh, state governments and through various. Um, distributors in, in the country. So in terms of how we are doing that with India or in terms of um, uh, what's the next step with, in, in relation to policy, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's an ongoing engagement uh, with MNRE, with uh, NIDE, with the National Institute of Ocean Technology, SECI, um, to basically bring everyone under a single branch or a single platform and, and basically ask them in terms of what they require in the policy. The UK is leading that conversation. We are having the conversation at the center. We are bringing all these uh, various government departments on the one platform. Uh, and we are also using this to push for offshore wind development in the country. At the same time, make sure that there's an integrated single system policy for renewable energy in India. And the biggest advantage of that single source, or if I can say single integrated renewable energy policy in the country, is it will not just aid the development of the sector, but will also help integrating your various renewable energy sources that we spoke about today into one platform using multiple tariff models and using various business models that, uh, uh, you know, in terms of best case scenarios in the world. So that's where the discussions are at the moment and where it's leading to from All right. India. And India. So, Srijit, so it looks like the UK government is doing a lot better than even the Indian government in getting all of these uh, departments and, and various authorities uh, involved in renewable energy and in power uh, under one roof to be able to have this, uh, I would say, consolidated comprehensive discussion. So great going. I mean, unfortunately, we've run out of time and I've got uh, Vijay uh, reminding me that, you know, this panel, uh, while it's interesting, uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, impinging on the next speaker's time. Uh, there have been several questions. I thank the audience for the questions. We will try and respond as we can uh, at the end of the session or by email separately. But thank you so very much for being interactive and, you know, making this panel um, hopefully useful for the audience here. Thanks once again to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Jiva. Thank you. Um, thanks to the panel. It's been a very engaging discussion. Uh, naturally, it's a ocean. Uh, it has generated a lot of interest. I've got a whole lot of questions, but you know we are running out of time. You deserve a separate webinar just for this. Perhaps I can think of another platform where we can do this separately with an interested group. All right. So uh, the audience, can you just give a thumbs up if you have enjoyed this? Uh, thank you so much because they have really prepared the ground for this. We have to move on now. Uh, because the next speaker is waiting. And I would like to call upon uh, Heyman, Heyman Srivatsa, to introduce the next speaker. It's meant to be lighthearted as well as inspirational. So in case you have been driven with a lot of numbers and metrics, now is the time for you to relax. Heyman, all yours. Thanks, Vijay. 
Um, see, whenever uh, one tries to introduce a speaker or a chief guest, it's a uh, cliche to say, it gives me great pleasure to introduce so and so. But in the case of today's speaker, it's probably more apt to say that introducing someone who gives you great pleasure. Because Sanjay Rao Chaganti is a happiness catalyst. My first interaction with Sanjay Rao was in 1981 when he joined my school with Mandir in the ninth standard. He is a year senior to me in school. And he, right from then on, he always stood out amongst all of us nivelling boys and girls. This was a guy who was fluent in languages most of us, most of us were unfamiliar with, that is English and Hindi. And a guy who had an easy smile and cheerful demeanor and had all the girls running after him all the time which really put us off. Now, Sanjay has spent about 20 successful years in the corporate sector, which saw him working in the US, Africa, and Asia, and then returned to India in his present avatar as a mindful, mindfulness coach and happiness catalyst. Sanjay has a master's degree in economics from Tufts University and in communication from Annenberg University of Communication. He is intent in cultivating leadership excellence by motivating people to lead more passionately and lead, I'm sorry, lead a more passionate and fulfilling life. And Sanjay's style of motivational talks are ideal for the kind of times that we are going through right now. His sessions are guided by the principle that people will excel only if they feel good about themselves. His workshops combine modern transformational practices with time-tested wisdom of our ancient culture and draws from life lessons that he has learned through his journey as a lifestyle guru. Uh, now, uh, that's it from me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my request to you is kindly turn on your video as per Sanjay's request, and I leave it to Sanjay to take it forward. Sanjay? Sanjay? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hemant. I'm just trying to make sure that I got this. Um, I may have run after the girls, but they, uh, they gravitated finally to Hemant and uh, he was the sexy left arm fast bowler in school. So I had no competition. There's no chance that uh, anybody came towards me when Hemant was around. Uh, so first quick, quick question to Vijay. Vijay, uh, realistically speaking, and given that we've had a lot of discussion so far, how much time should I engage the audience or attempt to engage the audience? I can't hear you, Vijay. Perfect. You're on mute, Vijay. Sorry. I was just about to tell you, you've got a wonderful intro. You can let all the sexiness in you uh, flow, you know, that you may captivate the audience. So we'll have 15 minutes, all right? Quality time. I shouldn't give you anything less than that. It's all Hello? yours, sir, Sanjay. I uh, what is more important is even if it's five minutes, that uh, the more relevant point is uh, how much, uh, you know, uh, the audience has uh, been listening a great deal about energy and uh, so have I, and I've learned a lot here as such. So first of all, really delighted to connect with you all. Thank you. Uh, you know, let's just dispense with the formality just see how the session flows and hopefully it will be both uh, enjoyable and fulfilling for you. And that's my goal for this session here as such. Um, so I love, very nice to see some of your faces here. Uh, Vikas, Ravi, the world is one. Hemant, of course, Arun, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, I invite you all others to put on your video screens. Uh, I've made sure that my lipstick is all set and I've got a little rouge going as well. So invite you to do the same, even if you haven't done so. So uh, it's always a pleasure for me to just connect with live faces and try to make this as much as possible like a live interaction as if we were there in the same room together. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Prahan and Sridhar uh, for, and uh, others for putting on your cameras. It helps me fundamentally. So for those of you who put on your cameras, um, how many of James Bond fans here as such? All right, so fair level of James Bond. So let me ask you, and you can, and this is, I'm going to ask you to put on your audios also at this and respond to this question here in this. Um, how many believe that uh, Roger Moore 
was the best James Bond? Sean Connery. Sean Connery. Nobody. Sean. Sean Connery. How many believe that Roger Moore was possibly among the worst James Bonds? No, not the worst. Among, the worst. among the worst. No. no. He was good. He was good. Not as good as Sean. He was good, but not the best. Not the best. Yeah. So, you know, I am of the opinion that he actually was probably... I used Not to, the best. The first movie was uh, Sean Connery, but uh, I, I almost had sort of the opinion that when I look back and see Sean Connery, he's probably, in my book at least, among the worst. But, uh, and yeah, not as good. So, having said that, um, if the time and energy and the technical gods help us, we're going to watch a short four-minute clip from Live and Let Die. Uh, Roger Moore's, one of his movies. I'm going to hopefully, let's see if this works. And if it doesn't, uh, I might just have to play James Bond myself. I've got the Sean Connery look. It hold it like this. Partly, if not uh, anything else. So let's see if this works. Um, and uh, here we go. So I'm putting on this. So let's get going. Oh, sorry, one second. Yeah, forgot to press the share button. Yeah. Can you see the screen, by the way? Yeah. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Okay, so we are on in business. So let's see if we can do this. You ever to hear this volume? Okay. How much do you know about crocodiles, yes. Bond? Oh, can I've, you make it a full uh, always try to keep them at arm's length, myself. <laughs> Cute little nippers, ain't they? I don't suppose those potential overnight bags are orphans. Oh no, we have some moms and dads as well. In fact, uh, quite a few thousand. This is the part I like best. Feeding time. I suspect the highlight of the tour. <laughs> These babies live to be 200 years old. Uh, look over there. That's an alligator. You can always tell by its brown nose. Ah, uh -huh. there's a wild And he's a crop. Got over careless with him some time back, and he took my whole arm off. Well done, Albert. <laughs> They'll eat anything. Even each other. Then again, sometime they can go a whole year without eating. <laughs> oh, I was rather counting on that. There are two ways to disable a crocodile, you know. <laughs> I, um, I don't suppose you care to share that information with me? Well, one way is to take a pencil and jam it in the depression hole behind his eye. And the other? Oh, the other's twice as simple. You just put your hand in his mouth and pull his teeth out.
Uh, Sanjay, yeah. you need to unmute. Yeah. So that was, um, yeah, a round of applause for Roger Moore. That was probably the, the highest level of acting that Roger oh, Moore ever pulled together to make yeah, that happen. And I thought for the, the British business yeah. group here, I mean, getting a British spy would probably be a good way to make a segue. Um, so I'm going to just use that a little example. And, you know, you've heard a lot today already about energy. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about the concept of personal energy. We've had a lot of it on, uh, about all other types of energy. And, but let's just talk about one important element related to personal energy. What was the, and I'm opening, asking you to contribute here as participants in this, as we co-create this. Roger Moore, James Bond's, what is his state of mind? What adjectives would you use to describe his state of mind when he is in that little island with, and the crocodiles all around him? What's, how would it characterize what happened? How would you describe his state of mind here? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Crazy, crazy. Crazy. What yes. else? Initially stressed. Initially stressed? Initially, my God, all stressed. Calm, Nick. Calm, Nick. Calm and panic. Calm and panic, managing to hold both the things together. What else? Find a way out. Cool mind. Cool mind. No, oh, I think he was just trying to get back to the girl in the evening to that <laughs> bar. <laughs> I was surprised it took so long for that girl comment to come. I was waiting right off the bat. <laughs> come on. I mean, that's on. a James Bond this movie. Come on. This is a group that I'm familiar with. I've heard many more things about the British business group. Okay, so what else? What else is the state of mind here? See, the state of mind depends on their capability. So Bond being a Bond, his state of mind is cool. He's if cool. A common man like you and me are there, then our state of mind is entirely different. Absolutely. It's difficult for us to say, what is the state of mind? Because and this program, and therefore this program is about becoming or tapping into the James Bond yeah. in each one of us. Because that's why I said, it's a, he would say, oh, wow, because it's a challenge for his confidence and talent. Oh, it's a okay. challenge for me. Oh, wow. It's like that. So we've got... The bottle is there. The bottle is there. Okay, so we got cool... We've got what else? <laughs> Adjectives describing his state of mind? Cool and panic. Cool and panic, holding those two things. Cool amidst panic. Correct. What else? Betrayed. Sorry, can you say that again, please? Betrayed. Betrayed, yeah. Betrayed, yes. But what was his state of mind as he was trying to get out of this whole thing? Screwed. Confidence. Cool. <laughs> screwed, indeed. He was screwed. But he somehow confident, yeah. What else? You, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just what is going through your mind? What is survival? Are so trying to live another yeah. few more hours, maybe. More hours. I think it's business as usual for James Bond. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Let me get to that girl in the evening. Uh, <laughs> it's business as usual. He has to get back. To say one up. Nagesh, see, Nagesh has got this very clear focus on what James Bond uh, and Roger Moore. Absolutely, are. that's what you go for, the. <laughs> Uh, you noticed that he was relaxed, he ha was stable, and he had clarity of vision or mind what needs to be done. He tried something with his watch magnet, didn't work with the boat, he went to option B, jumped over the crocodiles. Because he is born. Because he is born. So, these three attributes of a mind that is relaxed, stable, and has clarity. If we could actually as leaders, whether it is at work, we are the CEOs of our own lives, at home, or any other aspect, can we attempt to how lovely would it be to be able to cultivate these three attributes for among ourselves? And these three attributes have been actually known as descriptors 
of probably the single most underestimated leadership and life skill for all of us. And leadership that is and life the, skill. Yeah. The skill, the intelligence of actually of attention. Cultivating attention. Cultivating attention. There is one large study conducted by Harvard University, as known as probably the, among the largest studies on attention, which showed that only at about 47% of the time are people actually focused and thinking about what they are doing at that given moment of time. So roughly speaking, only about 50% half the time are people actually paying attention to what they are doing at that given moment of time. And when we are talking about not having enough time in our day on trying to improve our productivity by five and 10%, here is this huge window that is available to us. If we could pay more attention to what we are doing, if we can actually cultivate the attention, because this study went on to show two other data points, which are very important. It showed that a wandering mind, which is the opposite of an attentive mind, is an unhealthy mind. Because they tracked people and noticed that there was a correlation between how <clears throat> much the mind is wandering and how healthy one is. And then it went one step further again it showed that a wandering mind is also an unhappy mind. So it was both at a physical, but also at an emotional level as well. So can we actually cultivate attention? Neuroscience has now demonstrated what traditional cultures in India and other parts of the world have known for thousands of years that one of the four basic constituents which is most closely related to we mental well-being is actually attention. This is some pioneering work done from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an institute called the Mind Life Institute, which the Dalai Lama has helped create. That the cultivation of attention is really, really closely correlated with overall mental well-being. So can attention be cultivated? And the answer is a most certain, definite yes. And a huge benefits of cultivating attention in improved health improved uh, mental and physical health, but also improved productivity, as I pointed out. Imagine if we could go up from 47% to 57 to 60 to 65% of the time, we were focused on what we were actually doing. And so we are your team members and your colleagues in your office and other workplaces. So that's why a book worth reading is called The Attention Revolution and which is clearly articulates that this is a grossly neglected area, which traditional cultures in India, like in India, have known for thousands of years, that cultivating attention is really key to mental balance and to improve productivity. So how does one cultivate attention? Well, when we feel cold, we wear warm clothes. When we feel hot outside, we put on the air conditioner. So we really have to do the exactly the opposite of a wandering mind to be able to cultivate attention. And there's a simple practice done diligently and the mind can be cultivated to increase the levels of attention. And imagine how much that would do for us. So is there energy in the group right now for a five-minute practice? 
Oops, somebody is sharing a screen here. Is that the vote of thanks already kicking in, saying thank you very much <laughs> the Hafiz? And that's fine as well. Uh, so is there energy? I just want to hear for a five minute practice of attempting that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. For Roger Moore, if not for yourself, at least. Yes. yes sir. All yeah. right. OK, so I'm going to ask uh, the host to mute everyone here except myself. Right mute. now, I will unmute myself. Um, and we just. And I guess now I am unmuted. Yeah. OK. So it's a simple five minute practice. It's a practice where we spend five minutes with our best friend, our only friend who's going to be there with us until the moment we die. And that is our breath. So five minutes of spending time with our breath. Once a day, five minutes. If you can incorporate that into a daily practice, See how it feels at the end of it. If there's, as I say, the proof of the pudding is in its eating. See if it resonates with you a couple of times. What we're going to go through right now and we'll check it out and see how it feels for you. And if it feels wonderful, try it out. If not, ignore it and just say, you listen to Roger Moore at least and watch James Bond in action in the last 15 minutes at least. Okay, so let's get started on this practice. Okay. I'm inviting you to just uh, sit back I'm putting on my timer here to make sure that I respect the five minutes that we are going to do this practice only for. And I am going to ask you to sit back, close your eyes and be comfortable. And we begin. So make sure you're comfortably seated. Back is relatively straight. Shoulders are relaxed. And eyes are gently shut. With your eyes closed, Take your attention to any sounds that you hear around you. You don't have to identify the sounds. And just like a butterfly that moves from one flower to another, let your attention move from one sound to another. Now shift your attention to your mouth and notice any taste there. Maybe some remnants of tea or coffee or a snack you had. Notice taste. Shift to your nose and notice any smells around you. And now shift your attention to your body particularly where your body meets the chair that you're seated on. Take your attention to the various points of contact of the body with the chair. Shift your attention your lower back, shoulders, neck, top of the head, 
muscles around the eyes, muscles around the mouth. And now we shift to the breath. Take your attention to that small, sensitive part of the nostrils where the air enters and exits your nose. If your mind wanders, it's okay. Just gently bring it back to your breath. Just watch the next five breaths. Let go of the counting. Keeping your eyes closed. Visualize the room that you're seated in. Visualize your body in that room. Smile inwardly. You're healthy in the midst of all the chaos around you. Life is fine. Send out positivity and energy to your family, to your colleagues, friends, community by smiling externally. It's okay to smile. Take one nice, relaxed breath. And gently open your eyes. Take a moment to notice how you're feeling right now. And if you feel comfortable, just type it out in the chat box that is there. Whatever you're feeling, just type it out. Relaxed, stable, clarity, attributes of a mind that is attentive. And this is just a short micro practice that we can bring into our lives. I work as a coach with individuals like professionals, entrepreneurs around the world. And uh, this is a simple practice that I help, have learned to practice and share. And I've seen, certainly seen the benefits for myself and certainly seen the benefits for the people I work with. And in this busy, busy time that we have, capturing this simple asset that we have within ourselves and utilizing it to bring us calmness, to ensure that we can sort of manage our own energies because it's not the time management anymore that is our challenge. It's primarily our energy management. In your capacities as leaders, entrepreneurs, business professionals at home as well, management of energy, this is a simple hack, a simple tool that you could tap into. If you'd like a copy of this five-minute recording, 
uh, Vijay and uh, Hemant have my number, send me a message. I'll be delighted to send it to you. But there are many, many other apps and many other practices available. Happy to connect. And I'm going to pause here. Lovely to come. So, thank you. Thanks, Vijay. Thank you so much, Sanjay. I mean, I think everybody is in a state of nirvana or bliss, so they're not sure how to respond beyond that. Uh, I, I, I have one or two questions that came in earlier. If you don't mind, I will start off with this. Uh, we all seek uh, happiness, satisfaction, and contentment. What are the, are there any differences between the three and what should we aspire for? Happiness, contentment, and? Satisfaction. Ah. My father is 98 years old. And uh, my cousin turned to him at a recent family gathering and said, uh, they call him the general. He was actually a general uh, in the Indian Army and joined the British Army, actually, to begin with. World War II vet. And they asked him, he, your son is this happiness catalyst. But what is your what is your opinion? What is your secret to happiness? And his answer was acceptance of the moment. And as we have, it's simply that the pursuit of happiness happiness is a is not the pursuit. It is actually a means to an end. Acceptance of the moment. We have been taught the four noble truths or the four truths that will make us noble. I like to use that phrase about the Buddha. And actually the third one is simply that, not grasping, just acceptance of what is, and then using compassion and wisdom to decide how best to go from there. Acceptance. Satisfaction is a way to do it. Sometimes has a negative connotation, but acceptance to begin with. And gratitude. Gratitude is a huge magnet for abundance in our life. If you can just balance acceptance of what is, combine that with gratitude. Because as a wise person once said, if I'm not happy with the here and now, what makes me think I'll be happy with the then and there? With all that we have, can't we just be grateful for that? And that brings tremendous abundance further into our lives. So I would go with that answer, acceptance and gratitude. Thank you, Sanjay. Open to the floor. Any of you who have questions, because none of you have sent me anything, please. And don't feel forced. I know it's late in the day, so. <laughs> I am curious. Anything else? I would love to hear from you as to what resonated with you in the session for those of you who are still staying back. Even if there are no questions. Um, um, I can I? Your presentation, um, if I may offer, Sanjay, I, is this something is that people are still savoring. All right, so they, they don't have any pressing questions once they have once they've gone through your session. So I just saw uh, King Shub there. King Shub, you wanted to say something. And I think Balaji also. Yeah. Balaji. yeah. Okay, King Shub. Hi, Balaji. I, I shall I go? Please go ahead. It's my, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I missed some of the sessions in between. Unfortunately, the the delivery man knocked at the door, so I had to go and, and pick it up. Uh, but I, I caught some of the conversation. I think the power of gratitude, I think it, it's so important. Particularly the COVID-19 situation has taught us, you know, there are many things in our lives which we perhaps considered for granted. And then as we start to suddenly miss those things, um, I think their, their value become very, very uh, glaringly obvious to us. Uh, how could we uh, inculcate this habit of getting into this mode of being grateful for whatever we have already have in life because we often forget about it and without facing a situation like COVID-19? I mean, any, any suggestions, ideas of how you could do this? Because I personally, I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt you here to respond to that. It's almost like I paid you to ask me that question. Very simple practice. Wake up in the morning, write down three things you're grateful for every day. Wake up in the morning, write down three things. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. To cultivate, to cultivate, well, yeah, that's it. 
It's a practice I started on the 3rd of September, 2011. I can see the benefits of it over the years. I've now moved it up to 10. But to cultivate positivity, optimism, three practices every day. Five, three, one. Five, five minutes of this practice. Three, three things you're grateful for. One, one act of kindness. One act of unselfish kindness. And that does not include washing the vessels because you're at home a lot more today. It's one act of kindness, unselfish act of kindness. Five, three, one. Fantastic. My question was... Can Anaji, I, go ahead, sir. Yeah. My question was, um, I don't know it's quite natural for any human being. Uh, when you said, uh, close the eyes, feel the breath. I, I, instead of me uh, looking at the breath, my mind was wandering somewhere else. I couldn't just immediately come back to my breath. Is it a natural phenomenon? Or, uh, you Absolutely. 100% to... natural. Very, very good question. Balaji, the question that you've asked is probably the most important question. And I'll tell you why. Think of wandering of the mind as part of the practice and not outside the practice. Okay. So the idea is my mind wanders. I recognize it. I release whatever the thought was. I bring it back to my breath. Catch, release, return. Catch, release, yeah. return. And that is part of the practice, not external to the practice. I, I think uh, I'm forced to remind uh, one famous speech of Pramod Mahajan, the former MP uh, in the Lok Sabha. He said, what are the, how, how many governments we have in the, sitting in the, par in the Lok Sabha parliament? And described some are being inside, still being outside, some are being outside, still being inside. The famous, uh, if you go to the uh, YouTube, you'll find the speech. I think I'm related to that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sanjay, uh, this is Ravi. Yes, Ravi. Uh, one question. I think, you know, we, the, the current culture, I think, you know, we, the children around us, the entrepreneurs around us, businessmen around us, we keep asking them to achieve more, right? So we keep telling them that, you know, every day that whatever they do, it's not good enough, you know, do more. So the world around us is telling us, so you have a GDP of three you know, trillion, that's not good enough. You go for five trillion, right? And so that drives whatever, everything you say, that's counterculture. Right? How do you balance that? Two answers to that question. One, personal experience. Second, overall wisdom. Personal experience. I was Asia head for my organization, reached up there, uh, working across 12 countries. I had, a, I had a vision of myself saying, I've got to be global head in this particular technical area that I was. And that was my career path. Uh, and uh, somewhere between 2008, 2010, something, something happened at work, actually, a conflict for the first time I had a conflict uh, with my supervisors, not I, I, even with my supervisor, somebody and my supervisor sitting in the US was not supportive. And it just, there was something that told me how very quickly that how dispensable was I to the organization that I was involved. With. Just in that moment, I realized, you know, and I had been with them for a while. And so then over a period of time, there was just a recognition that what am I really going for here? How much more do I want? And it was from a personal level, that's what started my journey where I, you know, I had to make some you know, financial arrangements to, make, to lead the life that I lead today because I was walking away from a you know, multinational 20 year paycheck as such. And I don't, I don't have a full time job at this moment. I mean, I work. So, but it was really a recognition that when there is no end line of this for me as such. So now, the second, uh, the answering your question from total wisdom, our traditions have been rich in this. Our traditions have been rich uh, from India, from most traditional cultures. That there are these four stages of our lives, as we know from here. We have been taught it, you know, the Brahmachari, the Grahastha, uh, the Vanaprastha, it was called, but now known differently in India. Or you can call it differently. And these four stages of life are very well thought through. Freud has thought, has had it. I'd be happy to share with you a one pager on this if you, because I've combined what Freud has done and what is there from the traditional cultures in India. And so there are four stages of our lives. The first stage of our life is very much achieve, study, study, learn. Second, achieve. Nothing wrong with that. Wonderful. It's the grahastha stage. The third, when we start moving, mentor coaching other people, becoming the advisor, 
you slowly moving away from competition to contribution. That is the third stage of our lives, beautifully articulated in science as well as in traditional cultures. And then the fourth stage, when we become no longer able to even mentor and coach anyone else. And this is something that I'm working on. I want to call it this, I'm calling it the second innings, helping 50 year old, primarily men, 50 to 60 year old men, deal with the second innings of their lives, which is this, which is now that I am no longer able to add value in terms of the traditional adding value as an income generator or even as an advisor, I, and my physical faculties are starting to fail, how can I still derive joy, not from what the world has to give me, but what can I bring to the world? And that is the fourth stage of our lives. And every stage of our life is, is, a, is a practice, opportunity to build to that. That for the next phase. Yep. So how do we inculcate this value in our children? Wonderful that, yes, go after it, but recognize that we have, there are certain stages and then we move on to the next level. But as a wise person once said, the best way we can inculcate values is by doing, demonstrating the practice ourselves. Thank you, Sanjay. No, sir, thank you. We have to sort of wrap up the session. Uh, seven o'clock was our deadline. I'm Understood. sorry to cut the flow because I think we're all enjoying it. Um, if it's okay with you. Uh, we will now call upon uh, Vikas to deliver the word of thanks. Vikas? Yes, uh, thanks so much, Ujay. And I think, uh, as, as we all said, I think it would be great to continue, Sajay. I think due to paucity of time, we will... Uh, firstly, I'll thank you. I think the day has definitely been about energy and most importantly, the personal energy that all of us can uh, derive. And, and I think it's great to hear your thoughts. And I hope all of us were attentive more than 50% of the time because... I think the entire session was indeed fabulous and thanks Sanjay for, for, have, for being with us today. A uh, big thank you to Paul as well for sharing what's happening with, with the Deputy High Commission and the DIT uh, and, and the energy that, that the UK and India relationship is creating. So thanks for that, Paul. Uh, and thanks Jeeva, Balaji and Srijit for uh, sort of a worldview of what's happening in the renewable energy space. I think there's, there's a lot that I learned right from, you know, what's happening in solar, wind, uh, biofuel, uh, what's happening in the UK, what's happening in India. Uh, I think that there's a fact that 22% of our installed capacity is actually renewable energy is, is something that that's quite amazing to see. And I hope to see how that kind of translates into more renewable uh, output in the coming years. So thanks, uh, Jeeva Bali and Srijit for sharing your insights on that. And of course, a big thank you to Christy and Vijay and for everyone who made it today to to continue our virtual session. So thanks so much for making it and making it interactive and have a great evening and a great, a great weekend ahead. Yeah, and do encourage our members to visit our website. Yes, absolutely. I think we're all virtual, all, all digital. So please do visit our website. We do put up updates there and news articles and blogs. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone again. Have a great evening ahead. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you Vic. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. All, all the best. best. All, all best. the best. Thank, Thank you. you. The comes to an end, but networking continues. Uh, please go ahead, guys. Thank you. Okay. Close.